My name is Beth Ingram. I'm the provost here at North Dakota State University. Please join me in welcoming Professor Eric Mazur. I never ask myself the question, how am I going to teach? Which is kind of strange, right? Because when you do something new in your career, that should be the first question you ask yourself. The question did not come up in my mind. It was perfectly clear what I was going to do. I was going to do to my students what my teachers had done to me, to lecture. This is a picture of me as an uh, assistant professor teaching at Harvard. It's a very old picture. <laughs> the picture was taken B.C., before computers. You see, I'm, <laughs> I'm using an overhead projector. Now, in my own defense, I think we all tend to do that, right? We try to project our own experiences onto the world around us. And I naively thought that I'd learned physics sitting in a room like this, listening to my professors teach physics. And I'm sure that they too, when they started teaching, made that same assumption. All the way back to this guy here, who is a German king, giving a guest lecture at the University of Bologna in 1125. This is right. Apart from the way we dress, it's the same. In fact, you know, to remind ourselves that our traditions are, you know, dating back all the way to the Middle Ages, we still wear these robes at graduation. Um, but other than that, it looks the same. I was asked to teach physics to pre-medical students. None of my <coughs> colleagues wanted to teach that course because pre-medical students are not very kind to physicists. But not so for me. I, you know, I got a very high evaluation. It's 4.5, 4.8 on a five-point scale. And on top of that, my students did quite well on what I consider <coughs> difficult exams. So very quickly, I started to believe that I was the world's best physics teacher. Now, that turned out to be a complete illusion. Nothing could have been farther from the truth, but very pleasant. So it went on quite a while. Now, if you look at education around the globe, that scene that you see on the screen behind me is repeated all over the globe, right? I mean, we see it every, in fact, learning spaces, I guess this is more a performing space than a learning space, but I'm sure that most of the spaces on campus here are built this way. So I would like to ask you to describe the process, since you know that seems to be happening in most education spaces, that is illustrated on the screen behind me. What is it that is actually happening there? Projecting, uh, talking at, okay. Sitting, listening. Did I hear somebody say sleeping there? <laughs> Did, did, do I have to remind you that these are my students? This is me there on the screen. But you know, now that you mentioned sleeping, the French writer Albert Camus is claimed to have said once, some people talk in their sleep. Lecturers talk while other people are sleeping. <laughs> now notice that most of the words that we've heard, I think in fact all of them, pertain either to them or to me. Talking, I'm talking, they're not talking. Listening, they're listening, I'm not listening. Pontificating, I might be pontificating, they're certainly not pontificating. We're both there at the same time. So is there a way of capturing the process between them and me? What is it that is happening there? Telling, Telling but that would be again me, right? <laughs> sharing, that's interesting. But sharing, I see sharing as a two-way process. I share something with you, you share something with me. These are pretty passive there. One-way knowledge transfer. I like the transfer, I like the one way, but I question the knowledge. <laughs> Is knowledge something that you can actually transfer? Let's think about that. Is knowledge something that you can transfer in a room like this? I would argue no. Because knowledge is something that needs to be constructed in the brain of the learner. But I like the one way and the transfer. Information. Lectures focus 
on the transfer of information. And you know what? My students had actually rubbed that in my face very early in my teaching career. And instead of paying attention, I'd gotten upset. See, I just told you that uh, when I started teaching, I never asked myself, how am I going to teach? But there was a question that did come up in my mind. What was that? What? Not how, but what, exactly. So I went to a colleague who had taught the course before, and I asked him that question. He said, oh, in this course, we used, we've used in the past the book by Halliday and Resnick. Those of you who may have had a physics course a while back may know that book has been a classic for probably 60 years. And I was told, which surprised me a little bit, having been educated in, the, in Europe before I came over here as a postdoc, that students would buy the textbook. I mean, in Europe, you know, why, why would you buy the textbook if the professor is presenting the content of the textbook to you? You might as well save the money. But anyway, he told me, be sure that the bookstore has enough copies. So a month before the course started, I went over to our bookstore, the Harvard Coop. I went to the person responsible for buying textbooks, and I said, be sure that by September 15th, you have 150 copies of Halliday and Resnick in stock. And as I walked back from Harvard Square to my office, I thought, wait a minute. If the students have Halliday and Resnick, and I have the same book, then what do I do in the classroom? <laughs> I started to get nervous, you know? So I knocked on my colleague's door before going to my office, and I asked him that question. And he said, oh, Eric, don't worry. There are lots of different physics textbooks. And he showed me a shelf full of books that he had collected over the course of his career. And I started looking, and very quickly, I found the perfect book. It was perfect for two reasons. One, it was different from Halliday and Resnick, so at least I was not just regurgitating the contents of the book that they had bought, but that was not the important reason. The important reason was the book was out of print. <laughs> so for every class, I would prepare lecture notes, which I would put on the overhead projector or put on the board behind me. And because I knew that my notes were different from the textbook, I thought it would be good for the students to have a copy of my notes. Now remember, this was BC, so it was definitely BI before the internet. There was no way of posting them, so I had to actually hand out photocopies. So at the end of each class, as they walked out through the doors in the back, just like here, they could pick up a copied set of uh, the lecture notes, a photocopied set. Now, why do you think that I hand them out at the end of class and not the beginning of class? Otherwise, they would not pay attention or they would not stay. But isn't that already admitting that there's a problem? I mean, why force the students to get the information out of my mouse if they could get it from my lecture note? That, that question never, that idea, that thought, never crossed my mind. But you know what happened? What happened was that at the end of that first semester, about half a dozen students wrote on their end of semester questionnaire in the comment section, Professor Mazur is lecturing straight from his lecture notes. Hello? <laughs> I mean, what was I supposed to do? Develop another set of lecture notes to lecture from that was different from the lecture notes I handed out to them? <laughs> I mean, these ungrateful students. <laughs> But you know, they had a point. I was lecturing from my lecture notes, and if they would have looked at the textbook, they would have seen that the book wasn't that different from the lecture notes. Now, this scene here behind me is repeated all over the world. I'm sure that if we were to stop this talk right now and together walk around campus and pop in a few classrooms, you might see a room that's very similar. So that begs the following question. Is education just the transfer of information? I mean, it's not a crazy question, right? Because that's what I would say probably around the world, 99.9% .9 of instructors do. If you believe that education is just the transfer of information, press one. If you think information is more than just the transfer of information, press two. Okay, so let's see where we stand. In on this issue. I don't know what C is. <laughs> I mean, I'll ignore that one. But we have an overwhelming majority that says no, education is more than just the transfer of information. About 7%, so a dozen or so of you said yes. I have a warning for you. If you're a teacher, 
and you clicked one, you're in trouble. You're about to lose your job. Because let's face it, let's imagine for a moment that education were just a transfer of information. I know most of us don't agree with that, but let's just imagine for a moment education is just a transfer of information. If that were the case, what would be the logical thing to do? Put it online, exactly. In fact, it's already happening. What would we lose if we took all of our courses and all of our classes and put them, record them in different languages and put them online? Of course, we'd lose our jobs, but, but, <laughs> but in addition to our jobs, what, what is it that we would lose? Interaction. interaction? Did I hear that? Yes. Huh. Interaction. But how much interaction is there really? See, I'm trying to interact with you here. It's not easy. It's not easy because the space is simply not conducive to, to interacting. You came in here thinking, I'm going to sit down and listen to Eric Mazur present, and, and that puts you in the same passive mode you would be in a movie theater or in a concert or in, anywhere else. You know, and I make a, a habit of observing, of observing colleagues on campus teach different classes, and when it's a lecture class, it's always the same scene, you see. And we have some pretty good lecturers on campus, you know. <coughs> engaging, speaking style, dynamic, and they talk, and then after 10 or so minutes, they stop and they say, does anybody have a question? And the students look down, they don't want to make eye contact. <laughs> and if the instructor waits long enough, it's always the same person in the front row who asks questions. Most people do not want to interact. So I would say, we may lose a little bit of interaction, but precious little, because most students do not interact. I think actually if we were to put all of our courses online, we would actually gain something. Because see, one of the problems with a lecture is that there is very little opportunity to think. Right? Let's say that I were not talking about education. I wasn't talking about education, but I was talking about physics. And I say something that confuses you. Hmm, I've got to think about this. Your mind starts wandering, and as it starts wandering, you, you're no longer listening. Right? You either listen, or you engage cognitively in a meaningful way with the material, and you think. Have you ever had in one of your classes a student raise his or her hand and say, Professor, could you please be quiet for five minutes? I need to think. <laughs> It's never happened in my courses, and I'd be surprised if it happened in yours, but you have to admit, if you actually want to think, that's what you should do. Now, online, you could do that, right? You could hit the pause button and think, hmm, I've got to think about this. Not that it happens, but you could, right? So my point here is this. If education is just a transfer of information, we're doomed. We're doomed because there are better ways of transferring information than orally in a lecture. Luckily, I think most of us agree that there's more to education than just the transfer of information, so we won't lose our jobs. So now let me talk about, let me turn to the 93% of you who said no. What more than just the transfer of information is education? Social engagement, motivation, I would argue I could get motivated from an online lecture. I've seen some TED Talks that are extremely engaging and motivating. So that could still happen, yeah. Critical thinking and debating. Reciprocity, we're learning when we're teaching, very good. Personal connection. Personal connection. Although again, I would argue you can to some degree do that online. I, I've seen again some TED Talks that are extremely personal and personally connecting. I'm thinking of this one, one woman who got a, uh, a stroke and describe sort of the whole experience of a stroke while it's riveting and, 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 and connecting. The lecturer can get feedback from the, uh, from the audience and gauge what's going on. Combine, oh God, I got you fired up now. <laughs> Combining ideas to create new knowledge, two more. Social interactions. Social interactions. Synthesizing knowledge. Uh, so I think that last point is a good point to pause for a moment because that's more or less where I wanted to go. You see, it's not enough for the learner to open his or her skull, 
get the information in and close the skull and then hope to hang on to the information long enough to be able to regurgitate on the exam. As a learner, you have to do something with that information. You have to extract from that information the knowledge, the mental models, if you want, that permits you to apply whatever knowledge is embedded in that information in a new context. Now, I've often asked myself, where did it happen for me? Ask yourself that question too. Where did it happen for you? Where did the things click or stick? Or where did you have the aha moments? Oh, I, I get it. Now I get it. Did it happen while you were sitting in a room like this, listening to your professors? I see quite a few people shake their heads. No, no. It probably happened outside of the classroom, not in the classroom. But that was a crucial part of us becoming content experts. And you know, we were dedicated to doing that, otherwise we would never have become professors. Most of our students, however, are taking, especially in large introductory classes, are not taking the course because they want to become an expert in that field, because somebody told them to go and take that uh, course. Anyway, it took a long time to find out that <laughs> it was a complete illusion, that I wasn't the world's best physics teacher. I was probably one of the worst. Uh, I read about a test that tests students' conceptual understanding of force using just words. And the author of the test claimed that it didn't make much difference whether you tested the students at the beginning of the semester or the end of the semester. They would do equally poorly. You know, most of my students at Harvard have taken an AP course and gotten five out on it, so I barely even talked about force in my course. I sort of assumed they already knew about it, and I learned it in high school. So I read that and I thought, no way, not my students. See, after all, this author had been at Arizona State University, and he had mostly tested students in the Southwest, and, you know, California, Arizona. So maybe there's some kind of a disease that's raging in the Southwest, up in, up in the Northeast, at Harvard, it's definitely going to be better. But one thing I've learned is, you know, you don't just make statements, you, you show things. So I thought, I am going to show that in my class, students ace this test. It was too late to do a pretest at the beginning of the semester. We were about two weeks before the exam. And, but I thought, you know, I have to show it. So I gave this test to my students. It took no more than two minutes for my life to change forever because <laughs> They just started, or one student sort of slowly raised her hand, and I walked up to her, and she looked at me, and she said, Professor Mazur, how am I supposed to answer these questions? According to what you taught us, or according to the way I usually think about these things? <laughs> I had no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> And by the time the test had been completed, it was clear that I had a major problem. You know, students had no clue what the concept of force was. So, you know, I started to think about education in a different way. It's, it's not just about the transfer of information. The transfer of information is a necessary first step, but not sufficient. The learner has to have an opportunity to assimilate, or Piaget would have probably called it accommodate, the information. In the traditional approach to teaching, we put all of the emphasis in class on that first step. And then we let the students take the responsibility for that second part. If you ask yourself which of those two steps listed on the screen is the easy one and which is the hard one, I'd be surprised. I'm not going to do it because I'm going to run out of time. But if we were voting on it, I think we'd all agree. It's the second one that's the so it's kind of ironic that we put all of the emphasis on the easy part and then leave the hard part to the students on their own. We should really focus on the hard part. So that's when I came up in, in 1990 with the idea of you know, flipping that around and giving the students the responsibility for the transfer of information that in class I could essentially focus on the assimilation of the uh, information. Right now I want to pose the question, if if you've been able to successfully give students the responsibility for the information transfer, then what do you do in the class? <coughs> well, the answer to that question is nothing new. Teach by questioning instead of telling. Who, who's the first one to actually have said that? 
Socrates 2,000 years ago, and here we're in the 21st century, and still most classes, especially in STEM fields, I think you know, the humanities are probably doing better, are still mostly taught by telling rather than questioning. Now, it's not that I was sitting there thinking, oh, Socrates, teach by questioning. No, it was sort of a serendipitous discovery. You see, after giving that test to my students, not only was I shocked, they were equally worried. Right? It was two weeks before the final exam. They couldn't understand why they'd done so poorly, and they, they were worried. So they asked me for a special session to go through every single question on the test. So I booked a, a room like this. At that point, I had 250 students in my class. And I, um, I went through every single question. I remember coming to a question which, in my mind, was completely trivial. So I turned my back to them. I sketched a few things on the board. And I turned around. And I, said, I gave them the answer. I could see from their faces that they were completely confused. So I said, is there a question? They were so confused they could not even articulate a question. So I thought, boy, this is serious. You know, maybe I should, you know, bring in additional aspects. So I erased the board. I started all over. In the next eight minutes, I gave the most brilliant explanation you could possibly imagine. Okay, the whole board was covered at the end with equations and drawings. I'd worked out every little detail in the most exquisite detail. Of course, I'd done it all with my back to them. And I turned around triumphantly, <laughs> only to see that they looked even more confused. <laughs> and they could still not articulate a question that I understood. You know how it is, right? When, when, when you're a beginning learner, it's sometimes harder, hard to pinpoint what your difficulty is and is the expert you don't connect to, to that, to that, to that difficulty. So I didn't know what to do. I knew, however, that half of them had given the right answer on the test. So in a moment of despair, I said to them, why don't you just discuss it with each other? And something happened I'd never seen in my classroom. Complete, utter chaos. <laughs> they forgot about me. I could have walked out. They would not have noticed it. But what was even more surprising, in just two minutes, they figured it out. I was really stunned by that. I thought, how can it be I, the expert, try unsuccessfully for 10 minutes in two different ways to explain it, and they just figure it out? But imagine you have two students sitting next to each other, John and Mary. Mary gets it and has the right answer. She understands it. John does not and gets the wrong answer. <coughs> On average, Mary will be more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply the force of logic. But, and this is the crucial point, that's not the important point. The important point is this. Mary is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class. Why? Because she has only recently learned. She still knows what the difficulties are that a beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur learned it such a long time ago, to, in his mind it's so clear that he can't even understand why somebody doesn't understand it. It's what my colleague Steven Pinker calls the curse of knowledge. We develop these blind spots. We forget. And in fact, you know, remember when you were a student, often you wouldn't even bother asking your professor because the question would go straight over your head. You'd ask a friend first, can, hey, do you understand what was going on there? Because you'd know you get a, an explanation at the right level. So when I saw that, I thought, God, that's what I had got to do in my classroom. So I step into the classroom, I talk a few minutes, not half an hour like I do now, and I pose a question. And then after I pose the question, I give students time to think. It's quiet. In fact, I tell my students, you're not allowed to talk to anyone. It's as quiet as during an exam. If you talk to your neighbor, I'm going to ask you to stand up and tell the whole room what you just told your neighbor. Then I polled them. Initially, you have a clicker, so you may think the technology is important, but it's not important. It's the pedagogy that matters. Initially, I just had them, and in my talk this morning, we did that in, in, in the physics department. I just let them put the hand on the chest with, you know, one, two, three, four, five fingers. Or you can use flashcards. The clicker is just sort of icing on the cake, if you want. So I polled them, and I tried to design the question so that between 30 and 70 percent have the right answer. If less than 30 percent have the right or desired answer, there are simply not enough students to convince others. If it's more than 70, 
they're going to very quickly run out of things to say and they're going to be off task. They're going to start, you know, pull out their cell phones and check their email or do something else. But if it's between 30 and 70, there's likely to be a very lively discussion and many aha moments during that discussion. I tell my students also, holds for you in the back too in a minute when we try it out, if I see you sit alone, not talk to somebody, I will come and talk to you. <laughs> and the first few lectures I make a habit of quickly running through the They very quickly reseat themselves and talk to, their, uh, to other students. I poll them again, and again, if it's between 30 and 70, the first poll, it's not unusual to go to um, you know, much larger percentages after. Then explain, either by asking students to explain it or by providing my explanation. And then the cycle essentially repeats until class time is up. And the, the learning, the aha moments take place there. You'll actually see students go, oh. I don't know if I have a little video up here. It's OK. So you can sort of hear the audio there. So I read the question with them. They, and then they think about it. I let them think for between a minute and two minutes. And it's quiet then. Um, I see on my screen how they vote. I do not share that with them. See the aha moment there? <laughs> That's one of the most exciting things you know, when you see this aha moment, this light go on in the eyes of your student. And that's not unusual. I do show them that second distribution to close the loop. So what's going on? One, it's active, not passive. It is impossible to sleep through my lectures because every few minutes your neighbor will start talking to you. <laughs> Secondly, now it's a two-way flow of information. It's not only information going from me to them, there's information coming back from them to me. Thirdly, it's continuous feedback on the learning without any threat or without any high stakes. I don't give points for participation. I don't give points to get it right. It just has to be completely intrinsically motivated. So if as a student you're still answering A after the discussion and you see that 90 some percent of your class is B, it's a little warning, right? Oh, I've got to look at this. Most of my class got this right. I don't. So it's a way of continuously assessing your own knowledge in a non-high stakes way. And lastly, it personalizes the instruction. Student A can help student B. Student C can help student D, even though B and, or, uh, yeah, B and D have two very different problems. Right? So it's, in a sense, it crowdsources and personalizes the instruction. So anyway, so thermal expansion deals with the fact that hard solids, like wood or, or concrete or steel, expand when they get hotter and they shrink again when they get colder. It's a very important technology. Just to give you one example, if you've ever um, heard a train go by at low speed or been in a train, if the train's not very far from here, you may have heard this clickety-clack sound of the wheels as it goes from one section of the rail to the other. It's because they put the, section, the sections leaving a little gap tiny gap between the rails so that if the weather gets hotter and the rail expands, there's space for that expansion to happen. If you don't do that, bad things happen, as you can see from this railroad in India that was put you know, back to back. When you build large steel beam buildings, you need to take that into account. Next time that you park your car at a concrete parking structure, after you park your car, look down. And you'll see that every 10 yards or so, there's a rubber strip. When they put down these concrete slabs, they leave a little gap between the concrete slabs, which they fill with rubber, so that when it gets hotter, the concrete expands, the rubber compresses. It's not a hard solid, it's a soft solid. So it can take that into account. If you think, well, that's all you know, maybe interesting for engineers, it doesn't concern me. Well, next time you go to your dentist, <laughs> it does concern you. Because if the dentist finds a cavity, then she or he will need to fill that cavity. And if you were to just use some kind of a metal, let's say, to fill that cavity, then you'd have a serious problem the next time you drink a cup of hot tea or hot coffee. Because the metal would expand, and metals tend to expand more than other materials, such as the material that your tooth is made from. And ouch, you know, crack. There goes the tooth. It's in two parts all of a sudden. So the dentist actually has to use a mixture of materials called an amalgam, which expands and contracts the same way that 
your two uh, expands. Now, the reason that solids expand is that they're made from atoms. I'm showing nine of them here. And in a solid, atoms hold each other in, in place. They, they don't move relative to each other. And uh, when it gets hotter, the atoms get further away from each other. Cold and hot. That's all there is to it. That's all you need to know to answer the question I'm going to ask you. Now, you may wonder, why is it that atoms get further away from each other? I'm not going to ask you about it. but but just to satisfy your curiosity, the reason is that atoms do not sit still. They vibrate back and forth like this. And the amplitude of that vibration is related to what we call temperature. So this is, these are cold atoms, and these are hot atoms. Cold atoms, hot atoms. So if you were an atom, you wouldn't just sit like that. You'd actually be shaking back and forth. And as it gets hotter, you'd shake back and forth over a bigger amplitude, and you need more space. You can't get crammed together as much because you just push the people around you away and they in turn push the people around them away. And it's not just those nines, it's all of them. So cold and hot. Questions, anyone? Thank you for reaffirming that I'm a brilliant lecturer. <laughs> this is really wonderful. Although I think I heard a question there, but you know, I'm not going to simply ask you to regurgitate the same information. I'm going to see if you can take this picture of atoms getting further away from each other, all of them, and apply that to a different context. Okay. Remember, I'm going to ask you the question. By then, it's too late to ask me questions, OK? And you're not allowed to talk to your neighbor. If you talk to your neighbor, I'm going to ask you to stand up and tell the whole room, out of fairness, what you just told your neighbor. Then we're going to vote. And I'm not going to show you the distribution. I'm going to ask you to find after that a neighbor who has a different answer. So if you turn to your right and that person has the same answer, you say, thank you very much. And you turn to the person on your left. If that person also has the same answer, you turn to the person behind you or in front of you. If everybody around you has the same answer, do not assume you're all correct. <laughs> Get up, walk around, find somebody who has a different answer. Instructions clear? Good. OK, so here's the question. Consider a rectangular metal plate with a circular hole in it. Now imagine that we uniformly heat this plate. What happens to the diameter of the hole as the metal expands? Does it increase? Does it stay the same? Or does it decrease? So, so if you don't know for sure, choose whichever you think is closest to what may be the truth. OK, good. So now find a neighbor with a different answer, and then try to convince that neighbor that you're right and he or she is wrong. Go ahead. If you don't. Now look at that. You all got fired up. I'm not here to talk about thermal expansion. <laughs> I'm here to talk about pedagogy. The answer to this question doesn't even matter. If you look at small children, in a sense, we're all born <coughs> scientists, right? Three, four, five, six-year-old. They keep asking their parents, their teachers, why, 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 why? We're wired to wanting to understand the world around us. Whether you've become a social scientist or an economist or, or, or a painter or whatever, we were all born scientists. And it's kind of a shame that education and that's true everywhere, not here, but all over the US, all over the world, really, does a really good job turning this innate curiosity that, we've born, that we're born with off. The good news is I've just shown you how easy it is to turn it back on. Right, because imagine I had given the same little lecture that I gave you a moment ago, but instead of asking you the question, I would have said, let's now apply this to rectangular metal plates with circular holes in it. If we take one of these plates and put it in the oven, the plate will expand, and the diameter of the hole will, I'm going to keep you in suspense a bit longer. <laughs> you, know, you would have been sleeping through it. I mean, what is more boring than metal plates with circular holes in it? <laughs> Isn't it amazing, right? I, I, trust me. If you can do this with metal plates with circular holes in it, you can do it with anything. You can do it with absolutely anything. Now, you know, I want to keep you in suspense a bit longer. 
let's sort of analyze the psychology of this. I asked you a question, and then you thought about the question, and then you had to make a commitment. Right? I told you to make a commitment. We could have done this with hands on the chest, would have been exactly the same, or by clicking. And then after that, I asked you to externalize your answer, not to me, which would have been intimidating, but to a neighbor. And something interesting happened. We could see it with you continuing to talk and gesticulating. All of you moved away from the answer to the reasoning. All of you were sitting there like this, trying to you know, talk about not the answer, but how you get to the answer. This approach, in a sense, brings the thinking, I think it was you mentioning critical thinking, back in the classroom. But most importantly, you got emotionally invested in the learning process, because if I were to tell you now, bye, got to go, plane to catch, you'd come running after me, asking me, what's the answer to that question? Now, before I can give you the answer, you have to vote again. So please indicate what you now believe to be the right answer. <laughs> you know, I thought I gave a pretty darn clear lecture. <laughs> and so did you. Only a quarter of you got the right answer the first time around. And unfortunately, the method doesn't work that well. Because as I said, you need at least about 30% correct. So in a sense, you've made a very important point. Because in a sense, you have been telling me, by the way you voted, Eric, your lecturing sucks. <laughs> Which is actually precisely the point I wanted to make. It may have seemed clear, but in reality, you haven't even begun to learn. No. The right answer is number one. <laughs> So let's see here. Wow, look at that. Look at that. Let's compare it to the previous. So you started at about a quarter correct, and it went up, and all the other choices went down. So even though only a quarter of you got the right answer the first time, notice that it moved in the right direction. And right now at 40%, it's almost the dominant answer. Now, I don't want you to lie in bed tonight at 2 AM. <laughs> Wide awake. <coughs> so let me take a, a minute of my precious time to explain this, this question. Imagine you have a jar of marmalade in the refrigerator. It's one of these ball jars, right? Glass jar, metal lid. The metal lid is a, a ring and a plate. You take it out, you can't open it. What do you do? You run the metal lid under hot water. The ring expands and the hole gets larger. You say, yeah, but you didn't ask about a ring, you asked about a plate. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, could I have a piece of paper? Can, can I borrow your pad for just a second? The whole pad. Just give me the whole pad. Imagine we have a plate, sorry, thank you. Imagine we have a plate, no hole in it. Can you imagine that? We take a marker, we draw a circle. So now we have a plate with a circle. We put this plate with a circle in the oven. Thank you. We turn the temperature up, the plate expands. What happens to the diameter of the circle? Yeah, everything gets bigger, so the circle gets bigger too. You say, that's unfair, there's no hole. If there was a hole, <laughs> then the atoms would expand into the hole. I'll show you what's wrong with that. Let's imagine that we go outside and we form a big circle, each holding hands. So I hold your hand, and so one big circle. Each of us is an atom, one of these dots there at the edge of the hole. Can you imagine that? So there we are, holding hands. And now we all, at the same time, step in towards the center of the hole. What just happened to the distance between us? Got smaller. Can't get smaller because we're shaking more. We need more space. Well, the only way to make more space is to remove a few of us. But atoms in a solid don't disappear like that. Or to make the hole larger. <laughs> OK. Back to peer instruction. The first time I did it, I doubled the learning gains. I doubled it. I did not 10%, 100%. And in subsequent years, by asking better questions, I tripled the learning gains. I mean, it was huge, OK? And uh, you know, studies have shown that in other fields from from computer science to the humanities, similar types of gains. And, and the study at Carnegie Mellon showed better retention, which makes sense, right? Because once you've had this aha moment, it sticks. We've eliminated this. 
right? And the question is really, how do we effectively transfer the information outside of the classroom? My first impulse when I started doing this was, let's have the students just watch a recorded video. I'd recorded my lectures. Why give those lectures again? Let's just have them, since there's not that much interaction anyway. <coughs> one of them then watch the recorded lectures. But you see there's a problem with video. And the problem is that the transfer pace is set by the video in the same way that the transfer pace is set by the lecture. And I already said there are very few students or no students who will just shut you up during lecture because they need to think. Now with video you could pause it. However, if you look at edX data or pre-lecture data and so on, you find that the students do the opposite. They put the playback speed at 1.5. My daughter told me she goes to 2.0. <laughs> Amazing. How do you get through it as quickly as you can, giving you even less of an opportunity to think and process? The and there's plenty of studies that have shown that you know when you put people in front of a TV, they're passive. They turn into the brain turns into a meditative state. Why would you be more actively engaged when you're watching a lecture, or a lecture, than when you watch something on TV? Also, this again from the edX data, you find that the students maybe watch the whole video for the first class in the semester, but as time goes on, they very quickly discover that the way they're held accountable is by answering a few multiple choice questions. And they can often simply answer the multiple choice question by multiple tries or by fishing for the answer or Googling it or whatever. So towards the end of the semester, they don't even watch the video anymore. They go straight to the multiple choice question and answer them. But, and perhaps most importantly, it's an isolated individual experience. You, the student, and the video. Whereas learning deep down is a social experience. So I think if we have students watch video, then all that we're really doing is we're moving this out of the classroom, which you know is not the most important. So then I thought, let's have them read books. Because books have an advantage, right? Now you, the reader, are in control. If you read something that makes you think, you stop reading because you can't think and read. Well, you might read a few more sentences, but then you realize that you're reading without thinking about what you're reading, thinking about something else, and you go back. You are in control of the transfer pace. Also, there's lots of studies showing that the brain is much more actively engaged during reading than during listening and watching. So those are two big advantages of reading over watching or listening. However, we still have a problem because we don't have any real accountability. How do I know my students are reading if I tell them read chapter 22? And secondly, it's still an individual isolated experience. What we really want is this. We want every student prepared for every class. And I don't know about you, but ideally we want that without extra effort because we're already quite busy. The solution suddenly hit me four years ago. It was really like, duh, why didn't I think about this earlier? I put all of my effort in making the classroom a more social experience like you've just seen. The key was to make the out-of-class component also a social experience. So this platform, which is free, perusal at perusal.com, is essentially a social learning platform that is interactive. Students log in through their preferred social network or through the LMS or they can make an account. All these possibilities are okay. And once you're logged in, it actually looks a little bit like an e-reader, but it's not an e-reader, it's much more than that. The first thing that you'll notice is you can see who else is online reading that text. But more importantly, as you're reading, if there's something that you know, interests you or causes you to wonder or ask a question, you can highlight the text, which opens up a chat window, and then you can type something in the chat window. And as you hit the return, the, the highlight sticks. So after a while, the page will be marked up, you know, with highlights, and you can click on any of these highlights, and that opens the transcript of the chat attached to that particular uh, passage in the text. So here, for example, I don't understand how this combination of factors tells you anything <coughs> about blah, blah, blah. It's October 20th, midnight. Half an hour later, I think you may be able to think about the direction separately, so blah, blah. blah. Two days later, third student, different from the first two, says, this is a great question. To further elaborate on this, we can think of this in terms of blah, blah. So what do you see here? You sort of see an asynchronous peer instruction. Students helping each other parse the text and understand by sharing, which we've heard mentioned already by a number of people. 
So in Facebook, you have a like button. We don't have like buttons. We have question flags. So if you read a question and you have that same question, you can click this button, which increments the count. And we have another button, which is the this helps me flag. So in other words, if you see an explanation that is helpful, you can click it, which then turns that green. And as more and more students put it, there's a counter in front that gets incremented. And students' attention, attention gets drawn to important questions that have been unanswered and explanations that are helpful. So what if you, know, you have put a question and you're no longer online? You're in, you know, at the dining hall or whatever. Well, you'll get an email. And the email, first of all, reminds you of the question that you asked. 21 minutes ago, you asked this question. And then it says, Brian just responded to this question by saying, blah, blah. If this helps your understanding, click the button below. So there are three things you can do. Well, four, you can ignore it. But you can reply to the email without going back to the platform. And then whatever you type into the email gets inserted in the chat as if you had magically been online. Or you, if you don't remember where, the, where you asked the question, you can click on that, which puts you back into the system at the right place. Or you can click this button, this comment helps my understanding, which is the same thing as clicking that little check button. Here's the big question. How do you get students to participate? And we essentially use a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation drives. I would love to have it purely intrinsically motivated, but as you and I know, especially in large courses, you know, students are not necessarily intrinsically motivated. So we tell the students that the body of their message has to demonstrate thoughtful reading and interpretation of the text. Which means that if you, all you do is highlight something and write, I don't understand this, you get no credit whatsoever because you can do that without reading. If you highlight something and you say, oh, I don't understand this because on page 256 it says blah, 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 you get partial credit. If you highlight things and you say, I don't understand this because on page 256 it says blah, 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 and you reveal your thinking, now you start to get real credit. We want students to have a certain minimum of that, and of course we want it to be before the class starts, and we want them to be distributed, not clustered. So if it's a 20-page reading assignment, you don't want only annotations on the first page. And, you know. So with that rubric, which is on um, perusal, you can download and give it to your students, we get 20,000, in a class of 60, like I teach, 20,000 annotations. The students write more in one semester than the author of the textbook. So I can already hear you think, you know, how do you process all of that? Well, this is the exciting part. It's fully automated. I got together with a quantitative social scientist on campus who does machine learning analysis of social media because I realized that if you look at, you know, Twitter and Facebook page and you can do machine learning analysis of that, you could certainly do the same approach to look at annotations in uh, different textbooks. So we use a specialized machine learning algorithm that actually assesses intellectual content and we've demonstrated, I put one of my students, uh, I gave this as an uh, education research project to one of my graduate students and in her thesis we demonstrated that the machine tracks the person who has trained the machine better than another human being. So in other words, the agreement between trainer and machine is about 80%. And if you take two individuals, the best they can after even talking to each other is agree on 75%. Because you know, it's not completely objective, of course. So immediately after an assignment, you have a grade book showing you know, the names of your students and what they have for the different assignments. You can click on a, on a grade and see you know, how many annotations, which one were submitted before the deadline. And the students get the same feedback. But it gets much better than this, because that is just a stick in a sense. Let me tell you about the carrot. When I started doing this, I realized that those annotations were like a window into the brains of my student. My fingers were itching to click on them and see, what are they thinking? I was particularly interested because the book we were using was my book. But also, if I knew what the students were, had questions about, I could design a better class. Right? Because then in class, rather than asking the questions, they come up in my mind, I can ask the question that come up in their mind. So in the beginning, I was just clicking a thousand times for class to come up with some good questions. But then I realized, you know, we should really automate this. So there's a button in perusal called the confusion report, which essentially gives you for whatever the assignment is, this was chapter 24, this was actually from a class at the University of Central Florida, you know, it tells you the three or four topics that lead to the most confusion. So I can walk into class and say, thank you for your thoughtful annotations. 
it looks as if you were mostly confused about these topics. I don't show the confusion report. I just make a slide that has those terms on it. Topic one, topic two, topic three. One of you asked this great question. I just take their questions. And they'll go, wow, he actually reads our annotation. Yeah, nine of them, but they don't need to know that. <laughs> So now, all of a sudden, what do we have? We have a combination of intrinsic motivation. One is the social interaction. I don't show you, but it's fun to be online because you know you can talk, you can chat with each other, you can interact synchronously or asynchronously. And there's also a tie-in to the in-class activity. If you take the trouble of reading, there's a good chance that either a student will help you or it will be addressed the next week and, and next day in class. And then, of course, there's the extrinsic motivation, which is fully automated. Here's what one student wrote in a survey that we do. I think the perusal app at my, in my class, perusal app and annotation, way better than just reading a textbook normally. I've been reading for almost four hours now and haven't gotten bored. OK, in all fairness, I have to tell you, he was reading my textbook. So. <laughs> Here's Ohio State, where they're using it in a lot of large classes. This, this is from a 600 student introductory chemistry class. It makes the book fun to read. All the other students on my floor are disappointed. Their professor isn't using perusal because they don't read the book. Let me show you some amazing data, OK? These are three semesters. Three semesters ago, two semesters ago, one semester. We were fiddling with the algorithm. This shows the percentage of students versus the number of chapters missed before class. They had to read over the entire semester 17 chapters, distributed, of course, over there. So this goes on and on and on and on to the door there on the far uh, right. But all the data are zero, so I'm just omitting it. Look at the first bin. Nearly 70% of the students miss a zero chapter. Every single chapter is read and annotated. I don't know about you. But I certainly sometimes miss deadlines. I have other things that take my time. And you know, students might get sick or they might have an exam in another class. So if we add the ones who missed one chapter and two chapters together with those that missed zero, we get close to 95%. I think that's as close as we'll ever come to having every student prepared for every class. They're, at Ohio State, they did a really good, because they have so many students, right? They found that the students who are using perusal score significantly higher on exams than those who don't, which you know, maybe it's not that surprising, but it's good to actually see that in, uh, in data. So what are the benefits? Virtually 100% completion of pre-class assignments, much better than I ever had with any other technique. It also means improved use of class time, because now rather than repeating what's in the book, you know which parts may need highlighting. And already, the students have suggested questions that you can use in class. They help you prepare. <coughs> you only need to read that confusion report. It's free to use. If you use your own text, you can just upload it and done. If you use a commercial textbook, then what you do is you tell us which book it is. And the students get ebook access, which typically depending on whether they want temporary access or permanent access, you know, it's as low as 30% of the cost of a, of a textbook. So it's a win-win-win. It's a win for your students, and uh, it's a win uh, for you. And again, if you want to go there, perusalall.com. So I hope that I've convinced you that education is not just about transferring information, because we have good ways of doing that now. It's also not about getting students to do what we do. I want my students to stand on my shoulders. I want my students to be able to solve the problems that I cannot solve. We want the next generation to solve the problems that this generation can. We have plenty of problems, you know, from, from political problems to you know, health, environment, uh, privacy, you name it, lots of problems. We don't know how to solve them. The next generation better figure it out. And that means we must prepare our students not just to solve the problems that we have solved, but problems that have not yet been solved. And I think the only way to do that is to essentially engage the students actively and socially with each other, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Thank you very much.